Hello, my name is Damien Wild, and I'm from the Australian Family Coalition. This is our third video in a series on families, partnering with our friends at Full Gospel Business Australia. And wherever you're tuning in from, be it Australia, New Zealand, Southeast Asia or beyond, uh, thank you again for joining us. Now in the first video uh, that we prepared for you, we talked about some challenges facing the family. Uh, we discussed those at a number of levels, and it was a fairly uh, overarching view of things. In our second video, we looked at the idea that healthy families contribute towards a healthy society and how best we can invest in our own families. Because as we often know, there are so many things that attract our attention, particularly in the modern world, and certainly uh, with the way uh, governments are responding to coronavirus at the moment, it's so easy to get distracted and not to spend our time where it matters most, and that is on our own families. In this third video, I'd like to talk to you about what we can do and what we need to see happen for the family at a broader level. That is the idea that we need to be advocates for the family, for the common good. We need our policy makers to understand this principle as well. Because, let's face it, whether our own families are thriving and flourishing or not, many people aren't in our society. And we need to try and ensure the best possible foundations for family foundation and stability. We know that there are some very key economic matters that matter in family formation and stability. Now, this might sound a bit dry, but when you think about it, they are quite crucial. Employment, the idea of having a just family wage is crucial for um, supporting a spouse, supporting your children. The idea of home ownership is another crucially important uh, question when it comes to family stability. And the, the reliance, for want of a better word, on the, on the dual family income has also led to increased strain on families and also a, a difficulty for, for parents, particularly for mothers, when they're often left with a smaller window for childbearing years. All of these, uh, as you can imagine, have a huge impact on family formation. There's also the question of social issues. Now many of these you might understand at an intellectual level, the need for respect for life, for example, but we might ask, well how does that actually affect families? I think one key issue has been, certainly in the Western world, the advent of euthanasia and assisted suicide regimes, which is going to lead I feel, uh, to an increasing diminishing of uh, regard for human life. Certainly we, we have seen that in Europe, and I think we're going to see that continue to spread where those sorts of laws are rolled out. You can imagine that for older and more vulnerable members of our society, including perhaps people in our own extended family, this will come as a huge challenge and no doubt something they'll, they'll be fearful of. We've also seen in more recent years a move away from perhaps what already were concerning uh, sexual education programs in some of our schools, moving away from simple concepts like abstinence and, and waiting for marriage. We've seen even some of those programs now give way to, for want of a better word and for a catch-all label, radical gender ideology, which now not only seeps into our children's classrooms through not only official curriculums, but uh, through all sorts of other programs and policies and even reading material. But beyond the classroom, we're seeing this seep through our culture, uh, through government and through all manner of, of avenues in our society. So as you can see, the family as an ideal is really at risk in so many different directions. And this is where I want to actually turn to some notes in this episode. I hope you'll forgive me for doing that. Um, I do want to share with you some concrete examples of where some of these issues are being addressed. 
and I think um, it serves as a, an important example for us, particularly as Christians, um, of how a situation can be turned around and how a nation that embraces uh, sound Christian uh, values and ideas can see its families thrive once again. I think we know as Christians that we can't sit things out. We can't merely look at the culture around us and hope that we'll be left alone. It doesn't work that way. As Christians, we also know that none of what we're experiencing should shock us. We know that there's a bigger picture here at work. I'm sure you don't need me to tell you that. But putting those considerations aside, are there pragmatic reasons for hope? I believe there are. Hungary is a nation which experienced decades of anti-family, anti-faith and anti-freedom policies under communism. If you're aware of post-war history, I'm sure you know something about this. But in more recent times, the nation of Hungary has really sought to turn its situation around, rekindle its faith and promote some sound family policies. Only recently the Hungarian government passed some absolutely sweeping changes through its national parliament. Hungary's constitution will now state that, and I quote, the mother is a woman, the father is a man. Now, you and I might laugh at that, it might seem comical that a, a nation actually needs to put that into its constitution, but there are some countries, I, I think, where citizens wish that had been done, perhaps somewhat earlier. The Hungarian decision also defines a child's sex as that assigned at birth, ensures the upbringing of children according to Christian culture, and effectively bans adoption by same-sex couples. As you can imagine, these are pretty sweeping changes. The Deputy Prime Minister there, a man called Salt Shemien, and I hope I've pronounced his name correctly, stated that, we protected the family, there will be no gender madness in Hungary. Well, good for him. The government also stated that new ideological processes in the West made it necessary to protect children against possible ideological or biological interference. And I'm sure you don't need me to go into detail about what the rise of gender dysphoria, that is, gender confusion, has done in Western countries, particularly to children, over the last few years. Coupled with previous measures, especially tax incentives for families to have more children. Hungary is in the vanguard when it comes to pro-family policy. They really are leading the way. Less than a decade ago, Hungary's fertility rate was barely above 1.2 children per, per woman. What that means is the average woman would expect to have one child. When you keep in mind that population replacement level alone requires the average uh, mother to have 2.1 children, Hungary was in big trouble. Big trouble. But that rate, however, has now risen above 1.5 and it's continuing to trend up. Interestingly, Hungary hasn't yet wound back its communist era abortion laws, like the neighbouring country of Poland. But the government in Hungary seems to be about reducing demand first and changing culture. And I think for Christians, this is a really important message for us, that so many things are downstream of our culture. As early as 2011, the Hungarian government was running pro-life campaigns, featuring posters with an image of the baby in the womb and a caption reading, I understand that you're not yet ready for me, but give me to an adoption agency. Let me live. These campaigns, coupled with incentives, saw abortion rates in Hungary fall by, and I wonder if you can guess how much between 2010 and 2015, the rate of abortion fell by 22.5% in five years. That's nearly a quarter, a truly astonishing result. Now, the big question is, could any of this translate to countries like mine, Australia, and like yours? Well, let's consider the following. Hungary's fertility rate, even now, is lower than my country's, Australia's. Hungary suffered an extended period from the 1950s to 70s where, and this is tragic, 
abortions actually outnumbered live births. More pregnancies were terminated than allowed to see a human life enter the world. As mentioned earlier, Hungary of course was emerging from decades of communist rule and the, the cultural damage that was done. But despite these sorts of hurdles and others, and despite opposition from outside, Hungary is succeeding with these pro-family policies. And this success can't be attributed purely to factors like faith. And you might find this very interesting. In Hungary's most recent census, which was taken 10 years ago, only 54% of the population declared themselves to be Christian. This was a full five years before Australia's practicing rate of Christians fell to similar levels. So are they by any stretch uh, a church-going Christian nation? No, they're not. But having leaders who understood the importance of a Christian culture and of pro-family policies have been able to start the reverse of the situation in that country, which is remarkable. So really, if we attribute the course of that nation to any single factor, uh, at a purely human level anyway, you would have to say, to some willpower. Australia's statistics are nowhere near as dire as Hungary's have been. We have not suffered from decades of totalitarian rule. And we do have so much going for us as a nation. At this point I'd like to share some words from Hungary's Minister for the Families, Catalan Novak. Now, I had the pleasure of meeting the Minister a couple of years ago at a pro-family conference in Europe. Among other things she told me the following. In Australia the situation is a little bit like Hungary. As a government I think we can underline in every field of life the value of family life. Because, and you'll know where the, the topic from uh, the last episode came from now, Without strong families, we won't ever have strong nations. We won't have a strong Europe, and you won't have a strong Australia without strong families. The Minister is absolutely spot on, but where does that leave us? There are some fantastic MPs in my country, and I'm sure you have some great leaders in your country too, but we need more of them. And we need them to be vocal. We need them to speak up. As Christians, we need to do more, much more, to create the conditions for change. We can't simply let these people go about their work and abdicate our responsibilities. We do have an obligation to change our culture for the better. I believe we can do this. I really do. It won't be easy, and success is far from guaranteed. But I wouldn't be saying all of this to you if I didn't think it was worth trying and if it wasn't possible. So the final point I'd like to make to you is to reiterate what I said in the last episode. Investing in our families is absolutely critical. It is the first and foremost task that we have before us. There's no point saving the world if we can't do the very best we can by our own family. But we do have to remember at the same time the well-being of THE family, the institution of the family, the fundamental building block of our society for the common good. It's something that I'm resolved to, to do much more of over the coming months and years ahead, and I hope that you'll join me in that effort. Pray accordingly, and act likewise. As a final thought I'd like to leave you with we regularly discuss these very issues we've been talking about in this episode uh, with our 50,000 supporters scattered across every Australian state and territory and not a few people overseas as well. If you'd like to join us and keep abreast of some of these really important issues of our time, I'd encourage you to go to our website, ostfamily.com.au. If you click up on the sign up button towards the top, punch in your details and the email address uh, of your choice. We can keep you uh, updated on these issues and you'll be among good fellowship with like-minded people all around the world. So once again, thank you uh, for listening. I do hope you found some worthwhile uh, listening material in this video and it's been a pleasure to be with you and our friends at Full Gospel Business Australia. Thank you and God bless.